Hi, I'm Erin Marcus, former corporate executive turned entrepreneur and founder and CEO of Conquer Your Business. Welcome to the Ready Yet podcast. We're excited to bring you more than 100 episodes of interviews and insights designed to help entrepreneurs get the financial and emotional freedom they need in order to build a business and a life they're proud of. All right, welcome, welcome to this episode of the Ready Yet podcast. My guest today is Daryl Urbanski, and we've been chatting all things health-related, and I, I'm, I'm excited to put this in a business perspective. So before I let you introduce yourself, you know, we've been, we have this common interest in personal fitness. You've been in CrossFit. I did powerlifting and bodybuilding and talking about supplements and all these, you know, approaches to workouts. And there's this research, right? There's this research theme to what we were talking about, herbs, supplements, all that stuff. And I love that because you take that further into business, right? You you did all this research on what makes people successful. So as I put it, rather than, ta- you know, just listening to Bob on Instagram, right? We've got yeah. actual research that you've done. So I can't wait to get into that and share that with people. So before we do that, why don't you tell everyone a little more officially who you are, what you do, all the cool sure. things. Sure. I'm Daryl. I have businesses with websites, get customers and keep them. I've been doing this for geez, something like 20 years now. <clears throat> I'll, I'll tell the story. So I, you know, I've often worked with clients. I had a, always had an agency with a small group of, of clients that it was always kind of like a commission, like a base plus commission or equity kind of position working on different and different projects. I lived in Vietnam for a couple of years. And when I was there, I managed to connect with a guy who was a copywriter for Mind Valley, which is like a hundred million dollar company out of Malaysia. And just for kind of shits and giggles, we thought, hey, let's put on a workshop and, you know, like just teach some local people about business. And we started doing surveys and we realized we didn't even know. We realized there's a lot of English English teachers in Vietnam. So we call it the, what is the English teacher breakout or something like that. Anyways, and we put on a little event and it was good. We had something like 50 people show up and you know, we just kind of talked about the fundamentals and everybody loved it. It was great. We thought, man, maybe let's do this because we were both going to be traveling again and meet up or cross paths in Saigon because this was in Hanoi. And we said, let's do it again. <clears throat> so we started doing it, but then my friend had something to go and I was like, you know what? We already started running the ads and everything. I'll, I'll do it. We got the co-working space. I'll do it. Because the idea was we'd record the content, maybe make a course out of it or whatever. It wasn't a money-making thing at all. It was really just about uh, connecting with people in the area and and really, it was it, you know, let's just do an event. Maybe we might record a product out of it. Who knows? So I put this event on and one of the offers of the event was if you don't feel it's for you at the lunch break, let me know and I'll give you your money back. Mm-hmm. And I actually had one older gentleman ask for his money. And it, his reason was like, I just don't know computers. I didn't realize I told him that I can make help him make money. He was like, I, he, he said, this all makes sense. It's very logical, but I'm just not good with computers. And I already work a full time job. And that's kind of what you want. You don't, this is a bit of a side tangent, but bragging about never getting refunds is not a good thing. I remember reading about this from Gary Helper. He's talking about, you actually want people to feel comfortable getting refunds because you want people to try out your thing. So getting refunds, it depends on the reason why, is not a bad thing. Right, if it's a good reason, there's absolutely. You want people trying out your product. You want that. So anyways, so no, no refunds is no good. So this guy asked for that, but nobody else did. So I catered the event. All that it wasn't a big thing. It was a co-working space. I think we had it. The first one was 50 people. Second one was maybe 25, 30. At the end of the event, we're packing up. Everyone's leaving. This one gentleman that was there is picking my now wife's brain. And he was so shocked because she's this little Filipino girl, recently graduated from university. And she has a six-figure agency. And he's like, as it was a writing agency. And he is stuck in Vietnam teaching English because he can't get enough clients as a writer to pay his own bills and leave. And so like, we're packing up, everyone's gone. It's me and my daughter. She was like two at the time. And he, we stayed 40 minutes behind with this guy to answer all of his questions because we're there to help, right? Whatever. And at the end of all this and all his giving, he goes, by the way, yeah, I'm going to need that refund. And I went, what? And he goes, yeah, I, I use my rent money to pay for this. So if, if you don't give it back to me, I'm, I'm not going to be able to pay my rent. I was like, bro, come on, man. And I gave him the refund anyway, right? But I, I, it was after a long, like, bro, re- seriously? Like, you came here, you ate my food. You heard the whole, like, announcement at the lunch break. If you want your refund, now's the time. Now's the time. 
Yeah, you, you went through all that and then you kept us 40 minutes. And here's, here's a hint. I learned this in my martial arts school. When you have to make special conditions for clients, it tends to not be the only thing. Like how you enter yes. a relationship tends to be how it goes. So if you have someone that you start making, like it should have been a red flag when this guy was holding us back so long. I mean, it was short time, maybe not. But anytime you have a client, they need to make special payment arrangements, stuff like that. Just know. It never that- gets better than the first date, right? <laughs> right, right. Oh, that's a good way to say it. I love that. I'm writing that down. So, it never, right? It never gets better than the first date. The situation is fine. Okay, it is what it is. Give him a refund, right? Again, it wasn't my main source of income or anything. Three months later, right before the pandemic hit, I see this guy advertising because everyone in Vietnam's in the expat Facebook groups. He's advertising his own entrepreneurship workshop. Manifest the business of your dreams. And I was so livid because this guy couldn't pay his own bills, all this sort of stuff. And now he's pretending to be a guru. And what upset me was because I call them weekend, weekend experts because people like this, they do like a weekend certification program. And now, and I'm not trying to insult anybody, but it's just a fact. They do a weekend certification program and now they get in front of business owners and go, hey, tell you what, gamble paying your staff, gamble your ability to retire, gamble your ability to pay medical bills and your students' school bills on me, right? Because business is a sink or swim endeavor. Yes. Most people are not in business full-time and have part-time income coming in from somewhere else that covers all their expenses. And so that's what made me so livid about what this guy was doing, because there's going to be genuine people that are gen- like, this is a Google calls it your money, your life. And they treat websites that discuss your money, your life topics with a different degree of severity than a hobby site mm-hmm. or even a news site, because it can have massive ramifications. So when the pandemic hit, I felt like the sharks are going to be in the water. People like this guy are going to be everywhere. And some of them are well-intentioned, the whole fake it till you make it sure. Okay, whatever. But you know, I've been in this game for so long and there's not really like to be a lawyer, you have to pass the bar exam, right? Like all this yeah. sort of, thing. there's not really that for business coaches, right? Or consultants. It, right. And it was the reason I hesitated to put that label on what I do for right. so long because I didn't want to throw my name in that ring. Right. So I said, okay, sharks in the water. What we need is we need a scientific approach. Originally, it was called the fake guru solution. And what I was looking for is to figure out what the science said were the critical factors for success in business so we could measure a guru or a program's effectiveness at improving any of them. So we did all the research for that. What I found was that not a lot of people wanted to be third-party validated. In some ways, that was a tough, that was a tough sell. But, how do you talk to all your clients and find out if you're really good? Uh, I don't think I want, what if I'm not? So I was people that would talk. And then when it came time, and it wasn't even about payment. I had some people that paid, but then when it came to actually talk to people, they got like real jittery. Well, and I would imagine it's not all based in, I'm not doing a good job. Some of it's right. just fear, right? Some right. of it's just fear. Yeah. And my intent was never to throw anyone under the bus. It was about, it was about raising the level of the industry. That was really my intent was, listen, I've dedicated my life to this industry. I want to set a benchmark standard. So when someone gets hired, someone they know, because a lot of these, like no one's checking tax returns. You know, I saw this great quote. It was like, hey, I interviewed my friend. He's in the top 30 under, Forbes is top 30 under 30. And here's how he said he does it. One, number one, you know, uh, he's the VP of this big tech company. Here's how he says he does it. Number one, he's up at 5 a.m. Number two, he meditates every day. Number three, cold showers. Number four, his dad owns the company. And it's like, nobody <laughs> knows, nobody knows about like, you know what I mean? Like there's, there's so many people I've been behind so many closed doors. I remember I got out of JV mailing at one, and it's, it's a good strategy. And again, we're talking about exceptions here because I was behind closed doors in a city once upon a time. And it was like a discussion of like, okay, I'm going to launch my product this month. You're going to launch your product that month. And everyone was going to co-promote each other. But there was no discussion about whether the product was going to be any good for the end user. It was just like, you got to have something ready. And you're it's, the, be- it's the reason. And I, as I'm a big networker, I meet a ton of people. I referred a ton of business, but it's the reason I never liked organized referral groups because yeah. I don't want to feel obligated, obligated to give business to a certain person just because you bought your $30 breakfast at the same place I bought my $30 breakfast. Right. And these guys were major influencers in the space 
at the time and it, you know back in the day and so what i realized was happening was sometimes these guys would sell a product and i'd, I'd seen it i see some people comment like hey i bought this and I, I i didn't get results but their their bad reviews drowned out by this influencer who's got right. so many fans and you've got these five gurus that are singing praises of this program or product or software tool or whatever and so it's like the the reality for the buyer gets drowned out because they hide behind testimonials of people that maybe did give her, you know, like, so it's, it was that. So I was, how do we see our way through this? So I did research and like I said, I ended up hiring 10 different assistants from around the world. I got friends of mine that are PhDs and statisticians to help me kind of look at, over some of this stuff. And we have, here are the eight critical success factors. People are like, Daryl, just give me the baby. So here's the baby. <laughs> Self-efficacy, mm. market intelligence, strategic planning, Yes. Marketing strategy, sales strategy and skill, money management, business operations, and business intelligence. These are the eight critical critical success factors. And they drill down. Like what we did is once we kind of had the big umbrella, because what we did, I mean, I would share my screen, but podcast. Yeah, podcast. <laughs> so what we did is like I said, we'd look at all these studies and we basically in a spreadsheet factored out all the things that they said were proven or disproven. And then we mapped it out and tried almost like a Venn diagram where things overlap, right? Like what are the common denominators, the signal, the noise, figure out what are the umbrella categories all these things fit under. And that's where we came up with those eight. And once we had the eight, then we drilled into each specifically. Again, going through studies, like we looked at studies out of Saudi Arabia, Thailand, Harvard Business Review, like all over the world, Indonesia. And so like self-efficacy, we found that self-efficacy has three pillars. One is certain personality traits, characteristics, the person has to demonstrate, leadership skills, and personal discipline. So the personality traits were locus of control. That means being a control freak about what you can control. That's important, right? Don't sweat the small stuff, but what yes. you can, you know, like obsess about minor game, marginal gains and the things you can control. Extroversion. You don't have to be an extrovert. But business is about helping people and you have to meet new people to help. You have to be willing to talk to other. I say, I think that one, it goes even deeper. Even people who are define themselves as an extrovert. I watch business after business, try to create a system to build a business, avoiding talking to other human beings. Yeah. 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 Like That's not how this works. Nobody is going to buy your $20,000 program without right. ever talking to you. Yeah. There's yeah. no funnel in the world that is going to make that happen. Right. 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 So extroversion, openness to experience, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and acceptance of criticism and feedback. These are the personality traits that you need to have to be effective, to have self-efficacy. You need them. Your team needs them in order to succeed in business. The leadership skills. This is the other thing, because this is, some of these are so like, you know, I've been a direct response marketer and brand marketers. I'm like, they just hide behind. Again, I'm speaking in broad strokes. I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus. But direct response is what internet marketing is for people that know. Direct response means it's measurable. How much did I spend? How much did I make? Where branding is more about what do the colors make me feel? Right. You know, that, that sort of thing. And I, you know, like it's easy to be a brand marketer in the sense of in, it's not it's not apples to apples comparison with direct with direct response. Direct response is like, I made the company this much by spending this much. Whereas in brand, you don't get that direct correlation. It, brand does have huge value, like a hundred percent. I'm not trying to say that at all. Well, it but, all goes together. I think that is one of the key pieces. It's not just eight critical habits or all these characteristics. It's being able to combine them. Well, the brand is, uh, my in my mind, direct response is what gets the sale. And the brand is what you do is the relationship you develop with people that either it's, buys it's the attraction. Or... Right. And and that's the way that I describe, I say marketing is everything you do to create awareness of the fact that you have a business sales is the mutually agreed upon conversation we enter into once we decide if we're going to talk about changing money for services. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very good. Yeah. That's very, very, very good. hundred percent. So leadership skills, like is one of those vague, like what is leadership? And so for our, based on our research, leadership is self-awareness skills, communication, cooperation skills, emotional intelligence skills, and adaptability. That's it. The vision, all that stuff is based off your market intelligence and your strategic planning. The personal disciplines are things like physical health, mental health, time management, right? Discipline, sense of urgency. 
So those combined make up self-efficacy, which kind of talks to you talked about the health component. That's a really big important to it. If, if you can only run a mile and then you're exhausted, you got to take a nap. That's your energy gas tank you bring to every day. If I snap my fingers, now you can run 10 miles. You bring that much more energy and intensity to everything that you're doing. There's all sorts of research showing that you're more emotionally resilient, mentally stable. You know, you can handle more stress. Well, and the truth is, if you really look at what could derail, the only thing that can absolutely derail you instantaneously is a health problem of yours or a loved one. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. that's it. It's over. We're, we've come to a screeching halt. That's right. If that you it. or a close loved one have a health situation. A healthy person has 100 wishes. A sick person only has one. Right. Yeah. So... So first is like, you have to show up in peak mental and physical condition every day. Ultimately you do, your team does, otherwise you're not going to be effective. Right. And this is all then built. You're not going to have the bandwidth, right? Like you're not going to have the resilience. You're not going to have the reserves in the gas tank for the resilience that's required. Right. Right. To get through the ebbs and flows of it all. Right. Health. And it's the same thing with all, all the, I mean, it's tough to say people as I say, Daryl, what's the one to rule them all? And I would probably say self-efficacy, but, but ultimately you need them all because there's so many examples of businesses that failed. I, I always like to use like Blockbuster versus Netflix. Blockbuster was doing 6 billion. That's a B, $6 billion a year, give or take a couple billion. Uh, they could have hired any talent. They could have built any technology. They could have bought Netflix. They had the opportunity to yeah. buy Netflix. But their market intelligence, their strategic plan were not in line with the actual happenings in reality, right? And so they got taken out by a small startup, I think out of the UK, that had this kind of pizza delivery mentality of, of movies. Right, because, they used to mail us DVDs. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, you get a catalog, you'd call, you'd give the number of the thing, it'd send it to you because they, they got disconnected. They were so focused on monetizing <laughs> Greg Glassman says this, and I think it's fantastic because this is a really easy way to, how do I navigate through all this? Talked about how markets are unknown, ultimately unknown and unknowable. If I ask you how many people are shopping for a car today, you can look at indicators, but ultimately the true volume is unknown and it changes every second of every day. So it's unknowable. So you're never going to have that clear, but excellence is visible to everyone. So if you're clear on what problem you solve and you obsess over being the one who solves it with the highest degree of excellence, ebbs and flows will come into, you know. And it won't like matter. Well, I was always taught that in any buying market, in any market, there's really only 3% of a market looking yes. to purchase at any, I mean, that's like yes. right from the MBA, right? And Get so, the, yeah. Yeah. wait, this is like not new. So you don't have to worry because the good news is new people enter and exit that 3% every day. Right. Your branding and your market awareness is what keeps you front of mind. Right. So that when person A jumps into the marketplace, yeah. right, when they enter that point where they're considering making a purchase, you're yeah. one of the thing, you're one of the considerations. Right. Recency, recency, it's called recency bias. Yes. Right. You don't remember the best dentist you ever met. You remember the dentist you just talked to recently. Exactly. So that's the, yeah, that's the, the recency bias and that people buy when they're ready to buy, not when you're ready to sell. Now that said, you do need to have a process for asking questions that helps indicate when someone is ready and qualifies. Most people don't spend enough time qualifying. I'm probably as guilty of this as anybody but at least I know that that's the big issue that you need to spend two, three times longer than you think just qualifying. It's a good fit. Asking and I think the right. And I think the reason people don't do that is out of fear and scarcity. They're trying to find, I I've really made this switch lately where I used to try to find a reason someone should work with me. And now yeah. <laughs> I don't try to convince anybody they should work with me. Yeah. Yes. And, yes. And, and going back to your original story, you know, not looking at it that way and not having the fear and the scarcity that's making me try to fit a square peg in a round hole prevents all those problems. Like you were talking about that guy, you know, as, you, as soon as you start making concessions, the first one is just the first of, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 100%, 100%. Gong, 
Gong did AI analysis of over a million sales calls, and they came up with the 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 structure of the call of the ultimate like top salespeople. And it really breaks down the three phase, three phases: qualification, features, next step. Mm -hmm. Qualification, you know, budget, need, timeline, authority. I think that's. I watch so yeah. many people trying to convince people to buy from them when the yeah. they have no desire, right? Yeah, they have to have the, need, the business, right? They have to have need. They have to need your solution. They must. They have to have the problem that you solve. They have to have budget, right? They have to be able to afford you. That's another big one. I watch people trying to sell to the people who don't have the budget to afford them, and they have to have a desire, right? Like, don't make it any harder than that. Stop trying to sell to people who don't want to solve the problem. Right, right. Yeah, BANT is the acronym. Budget, authority, need, and timeline. Like, are you going to buy now or are you going to buy next year? Like, what time? What timeline? Right. You got to get the answers to that, to that first before you become the singing and dancing bear trying to show <laughs> off how great you are. And that's, and that's I, I say that because that's how I felt sometimes where I get on, like, I was just a singing and dancing bear. Yeah, right. I turned into McDonald's trying to wave in traffic right now. Like that's how, <laughs> that's how it feels sometimes. Yeah. So anyways, but that's, that's where you need these. And so going back to the leadership, you need to have self-awareness skills to see how you're doing, right? You need to know what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you need to develop communication, cooperation skills. You have to communicate, cooperate with your staff, your vendors, your customers. You have to have the emotional intelligence. I mean, yes. we've all for people and businesses that disrespected us or, or, or offended our boundaries in some way. And that ruined what could have been a wonderful long-term. I used partner. to, I used to focus on communications and difficult conversations. That was my background. And I wrote an article. I actually got a lot of clients just from this article and I called it, what is it like to be on the receiving end of you? Oh, that's powerful. <laughs> right? like, yes. that's, wait, if, if, if you can't answer that with a positive what is it like to be on the receiving end of you? If you can't answer that question with a positive response, you're going to run into problems. To a certain extent, I think that that's part of the real value of things like marriage. Sure. And that in our, you know, where you can order pussy like as easy as you can pizza with <laughs> apps, like all the dating apps and stuff now. Like there's no need to still, I'm sorry if that was vulgar. I didn't <laughs> I just want like it's with these dating apps and stuff it's so like you just a couple of swipes a little bit of chatting and then okay we right nobody nobody's had to learn how to the art of influence the art of seduction the art of influence the art of connecting the art of picking up a person like right they right. jump right into will you marry me right, right. they jump right into yes the horizontal mamba and <laughs> right. And that's this and, might be a time and place for that, but if that's all you know, well, my point in, in going back to what you're saying is that you end up having lots of superficial relationships, and so long term relationships teach a person their 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 shadow essentially. When you when you deal with your friends and that annoying part of you rubs them the wrong way too much too long, they just you don't see them for a while. And you come back and you're still friends and they like you, but there's that thing. And uh, whenever that thing comes around, I just kind of disappear. And there's no need for them to have that difficult conversation with you because they can just ghost you. Right, for they can just leave for a minute. But when you live with someone <laughs> and it's day 1,597 <laughs> right. of that annoying thing you do, they're like, look, look, we're going to sort this now. You need to stop doing that, right? And that's, you have to have that self-reflection. So I think, I think there's a ton of value. Well, you know, Naval says this. He's a, I think he's a, a great, a great tech, tech billionaire. I think he's a billionaire now. You know, he talks play long term games with long term people, but that really does require you to to polish yourself. I mean, Gandhi said this: if you will change, the world will change for you. And I think business is very Shakespearean, where in all of Shakespeare's plays, the character, main characters, fell victim to their greatest flaw. Yeah. And I think businesses, that's. And I, I think the unfortunate like the duality of younger generations have a lot more opportunity than someone who grew up when i did we didn't have the internet 
We yeah. didn't have any awareness beyond the five people we grew up with. Like we didn't know, we, like I knew what my best friend's parents did. I knew what my aunts and uncles did. That's all, you know, that's like that. The, these are the options, these six things. Right. You just have no awareness. So there's this huge awareness, but what they, what they don't have and what they're, how they're hurting themselves is the entitlement. There's mm. no personal responsibility. So they want all the oppor the downside is they want the opportunities, but they want it to just be handed to them. Right. Right. Instagram right. would have them believing it should happen instantly. Yep. And much of the rhetoric that's out there has them believing it's all someone else's fault. Right. And we're in for a long road of this because most countries only have one child, two max. And you have China with their one child policy where there's 35 million men that are never going to meet a woman in their life. No. And all single kids. They're all so, right? They're all little emperors, they call them. Right. They're all doted upon. And yeah, yeah. We've, got a, we've got a generation that we're going to go through that's going to be unlike any other generation. I mean, we have the boomers, but we're going to have another one go through that's going to be only child, you know, household kids that are raised that have very... They might have deep connections with a few people. And I and again, I, I feel like some of this, I'm not, in no way am I trying to throw anyone under the bus. But I think it'll be interesting because I think every generation is talked about around their negative and then right. they, right. And then they become who it is that they're going to become. They right. figure it out. I feel a very lack of predictability about how they're going to solve this problem. Right. I have no, I don't know. Personally. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting because we're we're doing things that are are transformational in other respects. I mean, we're yeah. shaking off the banking cartel slowly but surely. I think you know at the time of this recording, you know, we've had probably a dozen people who've fallen ill or stepped down or whatever. I mean, it's it's really hard unless you've got your head in the sand to to kind of go through the last three four years and not think that uh, people are abusing power. I think that that, I mean, I think right now they just approved the ninth COVID booster. So, you know, if the first eight didn't work, the ninth one's the charm. Uh, <laughs> like that's, like, I just can't even believe some of this stuff is still, this, like the, the circus is still going on. And, but a lot of this is being shaken off and it's, it's you know, based off of a lot of the research I've read in that, I think that around 2028, 20, 2029, 20, we're going to have like a final boss sort of emerge from the shadows because a lot of the underlings are now being dealt with it and will I, will be interesting i think my conspiracy theory i was never big on conspiracy theories and things like that but the one thing that i do know and because this is to your kind of point the research and the history the average civilization lasts 250 years hmm. if you look hmm. at greeks incas mayans huns however long you want to go back you know china now is not china old China. It's a different civilization. It's a completely different world. The average civilization lasts 250 years. And so yeah. you're seeing modern Western civilization go through yep. that end game that, yeah, you know, yeah. what is well, it going to work? And the world superpower changes at roughly every hundred and something years where it was the Dutch, in, yeah, yeah. and then it was British and then it became the United States in around 1916. And now we're 2024. Right. So it's What's going to happen? And and I don't think you have to have, and here's the thing, it's all very interesting. I don't think you have to have a negative bias about it. A change no. is not inherently negative. No, not at all. You just need to, It's and I think this is something that's important. It's, it's about, we all want to live a long, happy, healthy, joyful, wealthy life. That's my little mantra. Long, happy, healthy, joyful, wealthy life surrounded by loving and supportive people who are world-class at what they do and have phenomenal character. That's the whole thing. But we all want to live a long, happy, healthy, joyful, wealthy life. And that means you have to avoid, like, ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is death and disease and misery. And so that's part of where, you know, some of this stuff comes around. It's like, hey, how do we walk around these potholes so we can all walk in right. paradise together, you know, build utopia on earth? And and that's why I like your approach, because it's what is all the information? And I think that's to me, that is a smart way to go about it. Whether you're talking about your personal life, your health, your finances, your business, whatever you want to say, gather all the information so that you can make good decisions for you as opposed to defaulting to let other people make those decisions. 
And this is really powerful. You just described very colloquially the scientific process. And this goes back to what I said about the last three, four years, people like, unless you have your head in the sand, that you should be aware something's not right. And I'm going to talk about, so he said, as I look at all the information, so Karl Popper was one of the earliest science educators, and he had a formula for the scientific method. First, he said, there is no scientific method. There is no process which guarantees scientific breakthroughs. If there were, they would be more frequent in a bigger degree. What we have is a process to walk into the future through the dark and avoid fooling ourselves. And the process is a formula and it works like this. P1, problem one, plus TS, temporary solution, plus EE, eliminate the errors, equals P2, problem two. Or you are still at problem one, but you've found what's wrong with your temporary solution. So now you have to repeat and make a new temporary solution. Wait, so it is a circular NASA. process. It's so, NASA. Solve the problem. Solve one problem. Solve the next problem. Solve enough problems, you get to come right. home. Right. Right. Like where, NASA. And that's where. So this. That's where these layers build. And I love how you brought that up. Solve one problem. Because how do you eliminate the errors? Well, it's through observation, experimentation, data collection, and analysis. And if you're not working with a complete data set, you yeah. immediately, instantly know you're dealing with a blind spot where you don't know what you don't know. So when we go through this and when people aren't allowed to voice an opinion, this is part of why free speech is so important because with free speech, dissenting voices can be heard to expand on the data set and hopefully avoid errors before people get killed. And so when we, we, when we don't want to hear what people say because it upsets us or something, that's like, that's a personal issue as a species. We really need that vulnerability to be willing to be made to feel vulnerable by hearing things that we don't like, even if they are hateful, even if whatever they are, because we need to live life and work with a complete data set so we can make the best decisions to move forward into the future. What we need to avoid, in my personal opinion, is tribalism, and we need to focus on outcomes instead, because everyone can agree on what an outcome is, and then there it's about how do we get there. But people get distracted and and and, and, and separated on these tribal issues, and it, that, I think that's where we just get kind of caught chasing our own tail. But like you talk about, you solve one problem and then you build another one and another one. So for example, David, Dor I know I'm on a bit of a soapbox. I'm going I'm, I'm <laughs> to I, I, I set something. you off. It's early in the yeah. morning where you are. You already did your workout. I set you off. I got, you <laughs> <laughs> I got you all riled up. <laughs> so David Deutsch wrote this great book. He's the godfather of quantum computing. He wrote a great book called The Beginning of Infinity. It's a book you got to read six, seven times because you just like, like every time you read it, like you skim it the first time, you just go layers. But one of the things he talks about is that real science, good science, are specific explanations that are hard to vary without ruining the outcome. So a great example is the Greeks used to say that their legend of why we have winter is the goddess, whoever was kidnapped by Hades, and she's down there with them being raped and whatever. And so the world weeps and we have winter. But if you live in the equator, there's no winter. And so then the story just changes a bit, right? So the idea is that her mom negotiated a deal and she gets to come home a couple of months every year. And that's why we have spring because the world is celebrating that she's free. And then fall is we're crying because she's going to go back, right? But that's just, that's so easy to vary the details in that and still have the same outcome. And it doesn't account, account for things like, again, if you live on the equator, there's no winter. Whereas part of how we figured out the sun was the center of the universe was through watching the phases of Venus, just like the moon. We have a full moon, crescent moon, half moon. Venus has that as well. And once we had telescopes, the only way that explained that was if there was this giant glowing ball in the center and these things were this far apart, spinning at these speeds. And those are mathematical calculations that you cannot vary without ruining the whole thing. And that's when you solve that problem that gives you a solid foundation to stand on because math math is the language of the universe. And sorry, I'm going to shut up now, but that's well, I yeah. want to wrap it. I want to wrap it up with this because I know you and I, we always go off on tangents, but yeah. That's how you need to approach your business. Like, 100%. It's how do are you functioning from a full set of data? Right. Or 100%. are right? Or are you creating your offer in a bubble, having never vetted it in the marketplace? Are yeah. you blind to what you need to be as a leader? and grow a team because you can't have a business if you think you're the only one doing everything like right. that's not how right. that works right. like you cannot run and grow a business without 
an accurate full set of data. And to the other point you were seeing there, you don't have to be scared of the data. Right, right. We actually learned there was a ninth factor. Government and economy. A bad government, a bad economy can make oh, conditions. 100%. But what's liberating is that even in a bad economy, even with a hostile government, as a business owner, all you can do is excel in the eight critical success factors. There's nowhere else to go. Right. And I feel like that's the biggest gift of the research. Well, that it's I did. kind of where you started. Control what you can control. A hundred percent. It's where 100%. you started. So yeah. if people, I, we're running out of time. If people want to hear more about this, find out more about you and what you do and how you help people and all the very cool things, where do they find you? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, they can look up Daryl Urbanski, U R B A N S K I, Urban Ski. They can look up Daryl Urbanski on social media, maybe LinkedIn. And they can check out my website, bestbusinesscoach.ca. It's not to be facetious. It's not that I, I mean, I think I'm pretty, pretty great. My mom says I'm great. But it was because I originally started that domain, having a podcast, interviewing amazing people. And I thought that's where people could find their best business coach. They can go there. We have a program built around this called Habit Hero. We're currently working on an app for it, but right now we're doing cohort by cohort. So it's kind of by invite application only at this point. It's not because it's bazillions of dollars. It's because we're trying to make sure, I'm, I'm trying to build a scalable, repeatable process that we could put 10,000 people through that would help. It's business coaching via daily habit tracking and weekly challenges based around this research. We've already put about 400 people through the program. I'm working on a book. It's going to be, I'm trying to make it, I've already got a couple of business books that hit number one on Amazon, one that hit number one on Amazon and kind of disappeared. And what I realized is that the classic books, they've, they're full of stories. They yes. got 150, 250 yes. anecdotes. They don't have to be long. They could be just a paragraph, but they're really like verifiable anecdotes. That's how connect as a human first and humans connect through stories. So right now I'm collecting testimonials and case studies and actually talking with some enterprise level clients nice. about putting your sales and marketing team. So I would just say, you know, find me, Google me, you know, I will put me. all the links in the show notes so that you're only one click away. You know, and if you're, if you're just driving or something, just remember urban ski, U-R-B-A-N ski, S-K-I, Daryl. If you put that in, there's not too many of me there, especially in the business realm and just okay. get in, get involved somehow, get on my email newsletter and then just reply and let me know if you have any questions. Love it. Thank you for hanging out with me today. You know, I love chatting with you. We could probably go for days. <laughs> I know. Good. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Ready Yet podcast. I truly enjoy bringing these stories of success and inspiration to you. Please join us in our mission to empower entrepreneurs to be in charge of their businesses and in charge of their lives by sharing this with anyone you know who would benefit from our tactical and motivating advice, leaving us a review, and letting us know if there are any particular topics you would really appreciate hearing about. See you next time.